I'd like to thank you for inviting me to come. Uh, the planners took quite a risk, and I'm a developmental molecular biologist by training. My research interests are the genetics of psychiatric disorders, and we're not known for giving compelling speeches. <laughs> so thank you for listening. I do speak at nearly the speed of light, so this will go quickly. The, uh, and I'm from New York, or you're from New York, and I'm not, so I feel right at home with the speed. All righty. Now, as, as Chris said, I'm normally pretty skeptical about applying anything in the world that I live in, the molecular neurosciences, to the practical world in which you live. The biggest reason why it's probably difficult to take anything in the brain sciences, but even the cognitive neurosciences, and apply it to the world of hospitality comes from a simple reason. We actually don't know very much about how the brain works regardless of what you may have heard. We don't know how you know in real terms how to pick up a glass of water and drink it. We don't know how you know how to pick up a pen and write your name with it, and if we ever did, it'd probably trigger all kinds of prizes. So we don't know very much about how the brain works. That hasn't stopped certain mythologies from occurring. How many of you have heard that you only use 10% of your brain? Have you heard that before? You can take and throw that out at a resting state. It's probably 40 to 50%. How many of you have heard that there is a left brain personality and a right brain personality? Have you heard that? You can take and throw that out. You need both hemispheres to make a frickin' personality. <laughs> Our understanding of the brain is essentially childlike. In fact, it sort of reminds me of, um, as I look out in the audience, I see some people that are going to raise their hands. How many of you remember the old Art Linkletter show? Remember the old Art Linkletter show? Okay, about a third of you are raising your hands. For those of you who, who weren't old enough to know, he had a delightful variety show in the early 60s. And probably the, the best te last 10 minute segment of any show in television history. Do you guys remember? It was called Kids Say the Darndest Things. Yeah, he'd line up kids on, a, 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 on, a, 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 on some stools and he'd go around and ask them some interesting, very interesting questions. One of his favorite was, uh, how do you define love? And I'm told, I wish that I could well, put a YouTube on with this, but that's, I'm not even sure there's tapes of this these days. How do you define love? Here were uh, some of Art's favorite answers. This is from Carl, age six. Love is when a girl puts on perfume and a boy puts on shaving cologne and they go out and smell each other. <laughs> this is from Mark, also age six. Love is when mommy sees daddy on the toilet and she doesn't think it's gross. And then finally, Karen, age seven. I love this one. It's interesting. It's, it's so childlike and wonderful. When you love somebody, your eyelashes go up and down and little stars come out of you. <laughs> and that might be nice and sweet, but it's also childlike and in no way represents the complex interactions two adults have to navigate with each other in order to have a six-decade relationship. <laughs> and that's exactly where we are in the brain sciences. We have a childlike understanding of what it is that we are... Uh, uh, we're about. So what am I going to do in talking to you, uh, who is in the hospitality industry? Well, I can't say we're not clueless about how the brain works. Otherwise, I wouldn't have had a career for the last three or four decades. Um, there are two touch uh, points, I think, particularly on the, on, the, on the theme of conflict and change that the cognitive neurosciences might address. And so I'm going to briefly talk about one and then spend the rest of the time talking about the other. The first one is this. It's an important principle to know that the brain is not interested in conflict or change. It's not. It's interested in survival. It is the world's chief survival organ, period. Probably most everything you're going to hear today can be seen through the lens of survival and its uh, uh, fleshing of that uh, behavior, safety. The brain is trying to be safe on a continual basis, which is how it fleshes out Survival. So that's the first insight. The second insight is this, where we'll spend most of our time. The second touch point, I've been asked to speak on the topic that is uh, the, uh, uh, hinted at in the title. The title of this talk is As Close to Mind Reading as the Brain Gets. It's about a cognitive gadget we call theory of mind. And I've, been, and I've selected to talk about this because of what I'll just consider to be an unsupported observation. It seems to me that a great deal of success in the businesses that you guys are involved in revolves around two facts. A, knowing how your staff ticks, ticks their preferences, their intentions, their motivations. And B, knowing how your customers tick their preferences, their intentions, their motivations. And if you can satisfy both, you're probably communicating safety to them and all of a sudden, you're in my world. 
So we have perhaps something that we can talk about. Um, I believe this is especially valuable knowledge when there is conflict and change because you and your colleagues are going to have to know how to mediate one and roll with the other. So if you can keep your grump factor on, we're going to talk a little bit about the concept of, well described in the research literature, theory of mind. Here it is. It's in two parts. The first part of theory of mind is this. It's the ability to peer inside someone else's head and understand the rewards and punishment systems inside that head with very few nonverbal cues. It's close to mind reading. It's no, it's no mind reading. Brains can't read each other's minds, but you can read each other's intentions and motivations if you have a strong gadget, behavioral gadget, we call theory of mind. The granular part of that is simply the rewards and punishment systems. The second uh, um, uh, uh, part of, second characteristic of, of theory of mind is this. It's the ability to understand at all times that the rewards and punishment systems you're seeing inside someone else's head, we call that the conspecific, by the way, the rewards and punishments uh, you see in the conspecific's head are not the same ones in your head. They don't react like you do because you are not the center of their universe. They are the center of your universe. Does that make sense? I call it John Medina's second law of marriage. <laughs> what is obvious to you is obvious to you. <laughs> Thank you. Now, there's lots of ways to illustrate theory of mind once you know a little bit about the concepts. One, common form. This is supposed to have come from Ernest Hemingway. I can't track this down, although there's a number of websites devoted to things like this. Apparently, he was asked one day to write the shortest novel he could think of. Ernest Hemingway is known for his economy of words, as you know. He's not like William Faulkner. So he has this strong sense. Could he write the shortest novel in history? And he came up with one that is six words long. It's actually a want ad, believe it or not. And he, gets, he wins this contest. Now, I'm going to warn you before I give you the six words. This is a sentence or a clause that is going to be tough for some of you to hear. So I want you to fasten your emotional safety belts. Ray, right, gee, there's not going to be a big deal about this. And this is live streaming out to the public. And I know that. Um, nonetheless, for some of you, this is going to be tough to hear. Ready? For sale. Baby shoes. Never used. For some of you, that is catastrophic because you've lost a child. You've had a miscarriage. For some of you, this is a nonsense series of six words because you're just cleaning out the garage and you ran into an old present that you hadn't re-gifted somewhere. But whether it is catastrophic for you or whether it is emotionally neutral for you is because of your own theory of mind, your ability to penetrate inside those six words and begin to understand the rewards and motivations around it. And that's theory of mind, okay? That's a well-described cognitive neuroscience gadget that we spend a long time measuring. You can see it in, in the brain. There's probably even a gene or two associated with its development. So what do we know about theory of mind? Altogether, if that's the definition, there are three characteristics that I think are, you might, be worth, uh, might be worth talking about. The first is this. The first characteristic of theory of mind is that it is socially extraordinarily powerful and can be used for good or ill. I'll give you an example of each. The, the ill part might be this. Uh, I have permission. I, my, I have a, uh, and my eldest son is now 20 years of age. This happened when he was two, and I, so I've had to go through and make sure I have permission to uh, tell this story about Josh, and I do. So here he is. He's two years old. Josh, when he's a two-year-old kid, just loves to touch things. So he'd go to the, one of his favorite things to touch would be the bumblebees on the windowsill. So he'd go and he'd touch the furry little, and, and then he wanted to touch uh, glasses, a wine glass. So he'd want to touch that. He was touching so many things, we were afraid he was going to injure himself, and we were saying no so much of the time, we decided we'd use other words, like uh, when he would touch the glass, we'd go, fragile, Josh, fragile, fragile, and he'd be a good boy and kind of pull away from it. And he'd go to that bumblebee and we'd go, oh, danger, danger, Josh, bumblebee, whoa. So this happened when he was two. It's sunny in Seattle, which is very unusual in the springtime in Seattle. And we're out, and Josh also loved to do the pointing game. Familiar with the pointing game? You know, you're pointing at things and laughing. Oh, look at that. Ha, ha, isn't that funny? Oh, look at that. Isn't that funny? Ha, we're sitting there pointing at things. We're out there in the grass, and there's clover. And if there's clover in the springtime, what else is there there? Bees, tasty, wonderful bumblebees. 
So he goes down to touch one of those tasty, wonderful bumblebees, and we notice that and say, hey, Josh, Josh, danger, danger, whoa, buddy. And he's a good boy, pulls his hand away. But at the same time he does that, he takes his other hand and points at what turned out to be a nondescript region of the sky. And I thought he was like a bird or something, so I was looking at him to say, oh, look at that. And then I heard immediately a yelp, ah! And he took his hand, and it was like this. Because the son of a gun diverted the old man to look at the sky so he could go down and touch the frickin' bumblebee. A presage to what would happen to him as a teenager. <laughs> no, he's a good kid, actually, a really good kid. So he was using his theory of mind, wasn't he? His understanding of my interior motivations to be able to go to and look at something that he wanted to do. Okay, that can be used for ill. Here's a good example. In fact, if you think of uh, what we sometimes call pro-social theory of mind, it appears to be related to the concept of empathy. It's not, I, uh, empathy is probably has a different neurological signature, but it's close enough that we can divide the concept of empathy into two parts, active and passive. I'll give you an example of each. And it all involves a theory of mind. So theory of mind isn't just used for ill, it's also used for good, and that's the point. Okay, active empathy. My two-year-old daughter was so cute today. This is a quote from a, a, an old website called trueconfessions.com. It's no longer supported. It's kind of a gillnet. If you were a parent, you could just type in whatever you thought was interesting, and up this would come. My two-year-old daughter was so cute today. My husband was watching football, and when his team made a touchdown, he got all excited and pretended to headbutt me, except I didn't expect it and moved, so he ended up headbutting me for real. It hurt. While my husband was busy apologizing profusely, my daughter brought me her special blankie she never lets go of and her pacifier and shoved it into my mouth and made me lay down on her blanket to make me feel better. LOL. <laughs> now, was the daughter's head hurting? No. She was projecting that. She was using her theory of mind and then maybe even pro-social saying, maybe I could put a Band-Aid on this alley. What do you do when you've got an alley? Well, you take out a pacifier and a blanket and that's pro-social theory of mind. That's called active empathy. Here's an example of passive empathy. Um, how many of you are familiar with Leo Buscavia? He's dead now. Uh, he was emeritus out of USC. He probably put, not exactly a rigorous scientist, but he put emotional regulation on the map. And for guys like me that came along in the next generation, it was actually fairly valuable. And on the basis of that uh, uh, experience, Leo Buscaglia was once asked to find the most caring child in America. Isn't that just like the United States? Ha! My kid's more caring than yours. Ha ha! Bonk! <laughs> my kid. But Leo was a good sport. And he found one, and it was eventually published what he, find, what, he, what, what he found. And the description turns out to be a perfect example of what we call passive empathy. But it's pro-social theory of mind. That's the point. Leo Buscaglia was once asked to judge a contest to find the most caring child. The four-year-old who won related a story about his next-door elderly neighbor. The man had just lost his wife of many decades. The four-year-old heard the old man sobbing in his backyard and decided to investigate. Crawling onto the neighbor's lap, the boy just sat there while the old man grieved. This was strangely comforting to the gentleman. His mom later asked her, his, his mom later asked her son, what in the world had he said to his neighbor to make him feel so much better? Nothing, the little guy replied. I just helped him cry. Powerful stuff, this theory of mind. Characteristic number two. It is uneven in people. If characteristic number one is it can be used for ill or for good, characteristic number two, it's uneven. Some people appear to be born with a lot of it. Some people appear to be born with not very much of it at all. Fortunately, you can train people to get better at theory of mind skills, at least on the surface. I'm not sure how much gets internalized. But to show exactly what it looks like if somebody is an emotionally blunt instrument and probably somebody you would not want to hire in your hospitality profession, especially if there is a job of where there's conflict and change is occurring, I have for your, uh, for your perusal a letter from Dear Ann Landers. How many of you remember Dear Ann Landers? For those of you who remember Art Linkletter, yep, I'm a baby boomer, at least a younger brother of one. 
Here is my favorite letter that illustrates an emotionally blunt instrument and somebody who does not have strong theory of mind. Dear Abby, I'm an Italian man aged 34. I am of medium build and am told that I am good looking. I drive a sightseeing bus by day, so I speak a little English. I am single and would like to correspond with an American woman between the ages of 30 and 65. She doesn't have to be beautiful, but I want one who has a steady income and owns a late model American automobile. <laughs> if you know of a woman who would like to correspond with me, please ask her to send a picture of the automobile. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, how far did that get you? <laughs> Theory of mind is uneven. You can see it beautifully in a three-year-old, and you can see it not at all in a 34-year-old. Characteristic number three, you can measure theory of mind in people. In fact, I'm going to give you uh, 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 just the name of a test that you can go to a website today and get your own score to see how strong your theory of mind is. It's called the RME test, reading the mind in the eyes test. There's also another one called the IRI, interpersonal reactivity index. Both of these are very strong psychometric tests with high internal validity, high reliability, and they're really good scores. RME, reading the mind, it was actually reading the mind in the eyes. It's where you're just gonna take a look at, a, at, at some eyes and you have to infer the mental state. It's tough, but it's a strong measure of theory of mind and was invented by Simon Baron Cohen. Does that name sound at all familiar to you? He has a very famous cousin. One of the world's great cognitive neuroscientists has a cousin who's Borat. <laughs> Sasha Baron Cohen, literally. So make sure when you look on the website, make sure you go Simon Baron Cohen and RME, and then it will come right up. And what you will see is something that is absolutely fascinating, so powerful, and it's what I'll leave you with here, is this. Um, this was never published that I'm aware of, but when you take this test and you have somebody with a strong theory of mind, this is what can happen. If I say the word non-invasive imaging to you, do you know what I mean? You can put your head on what's called an fMRI, and there's a big old strong magnet, and you can see little dots that come in, so you can see how, how your brain is active. So if I put you in one of these machines, and I say the following sentence, the king died, and then the queen died, there's not something particularly emotionally strong that sentence, and you flatline. Even if you've got really good, strong theory of mind, you have an RME test that's actually quite good, you are going to have, it's going to flatline. But if you've got strong theory of mind, I can make that machine light up like the 4th of July, because your brain will. All I have to do is add two little words at the very end of that sentence, and here they are. The king died, and then the queen died of grief. Now you have an insight into their relationship, don't you? Now you have a sense for where that relationship is going. And if you've got strong theory of mind skills, you're gonna be able to find it. It may be that in the restaurants and hospitality functions of the future, uh, you will utilize this test in your job screening. Certainly someone who has strong theory of mind is probably gonna be a better maitre d' than someone who does not. And for those of you who have to deal constantly with conflict and change, where there are places that are extraordinarily powerful, where theory of mind would be very good to have, being able to look at that might be a very powerful thing to do. So go ahead and take the test yourself and see where you score. And maybe, if that's the, if that's the case, I was a little disingenuous when I started here, because I said that I don't think brain science has very much to say. I still don't. But in the future, it probably will say a whole lot, especially as your world and my world begin to touch base, something we don't do very often. Perhaps that's the reason why you guys invited me to come over today. It's certainly the reason why I said yes. Thank you very much.